in the letter to the Romans, the the eighth chapter, looking again at the first uh, 13 verses here. It's at this point that Paul starts to speak in Romans about the work of the Holy Spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the principle of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the principle of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, that's to say by the weakness of our flesh and not by the weakness of the law, God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as a sin offering, he condemned sin in his own flesh in order that the just requirement of the law, the Ten Commandments, might be filled to the full in us who walk not according to the flesh, but who walk according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh, rather than in Christ, cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, You are in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although your bodies are dead because of sin, your spirits are alive because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will at the end of the age give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And so, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons or the children of God. Amen. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word and grant us an understanding of of it. We come to the in the first uh, 14 verses of uh, Romans uh, chapter 8 Paul presents us with the two lifestyles or uh, two options and it is uh, quite clear that in Romans 8 he is continuing the series of pairs that uh, has characterized his teaching in uh, chapters 5 6 and 7. You may recall that in uh, chapter 5 he holds up the first pair, two men, Adam and Christ. And he says that all men are either in the one or in the other. We are in Adam or we are in Christ. In uh, chapter 6 he speaks about the second pair, 
and this time it's two masters. The first is sin, and the second is righteousness. And he points out that all men are either the slaves of the one or of the other. Men are either the slaves of sin or they are in the bond service of evangelical righteousness. In uh, chapter 7, he speaks of the third pair. And this time, it's two husbands. And the first is the law, and the second is Christ. And he says, all men are either married to the one or to the other. We are either married to the law, the ethical and moral code of God as a way of life and salvation, or else we are married to Jesus Christ as the way of life and uh, salvation. Two men, Adam or Christ, and you are in the one or the other. Two masters, sin and righteousness and you are either the slave of the one or the slave of the other two husbands the law and Christ and you're either married to the one or married to the other and now here in chapter 8 he speaks about two lifestyles or two options the way of the spirit or the way of the flesh walking according to the spirit or walking according to the flesh having the mind of the spirit or having the mind of the flesh the one option leads to life and peace and the other option leads to enmity against God and death. In uh, verse 4, for example, he describes these two options as um, walks. Towards the end of verse 4, he speak about, speaks about those who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In verse 5, the two options are described as lifestyles. He speaks about those who live according to the flesh and those who live according to the Spirit. And also in verse 5, he speaks about mental attitudes. He speaks about people whose minds are on the things of the flesh and other people whose minds are on the things of the Spirit. And therefore, according to these verses in uh, Romans 8, these are the basic realities of uh, spiritual life. <clears throat> walking according to the Spirit, or walking according to the flesh. Living according to the Spirit or living according to the flesh. Setting your mind on the things of the Spirit or setting your mind on the things of the flesh. And on the one side you have life and peace and on the other side you have hostility and death. Let me start simply this morning, therefore, with two words of introduction to these uh, lifestyles or uh, options. The first is this. <clears throat> this teaching here in uh, Romans uh, chapter 8 is obviously an extension of Paul's teaching in Galatians chapter 3, where he speaks about the fruit of the Spirit and the works of the flesh. And there again in uh, Galatians chapter 3, you have uh, the two lifestyles and the two options. Let 
me read you these words from um, Galatians, uh, I beg your pardon, not chapter 3, chapter 5. Galatians uh, chapter 5, listen to these words from verse um, 16 onwards. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other. There's a battle between them. Verse 18. If you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are plain. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, which means uh, playing with uh, spiritualism and the world of black magic, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. You see, at the end of this long list, he leaves it open-ended. And the like, implying that he could go on and make the list longer. And these are the works of the flesh. It's the treadmill and the bondage of uh, living according to the flesh. He goes on to say, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But as opposed to the works of the flesh, he says, the fruit of the Spirit. Now, fruit comes gently. It comes imperceptibly. Fruit of the Spirit. And there are three threes here. Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness. Faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Three times three. It's ordered. It's a world of cosmos. And of harmony. And of balance. Not like the works of the flesh. Which is a world of chaos. It's a madhouse. Against such. The fruit of the spirit. There is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus. Have crucified the flesh with its passions and uh, desires. And it's clear that Romans 8 is a continuation of what Paul says in Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, living in the Spirit, setting your mind on the things of the Spirit, life and peace, and the other world, the works of the flesh, walking in the flesh, living in the flesh, setting your mind on the things of the flesh, enmity and death. The second word of introduction is this. <clears throat> that these two worlds are two lifestyles, spirit and flesh, are not continuous worlds. You don't just gradually drift from the one into the other, as if um, living in the spirit were simply a better way of living than living in the flesh. You see, the contrast here is not between better persons and worse, persons, the contrast here is between different persons and everyone else, because a Christian 
is not simply someone who is a better person than an unbeliever. A Christian is someone who is completely different from an unbeliever. A Christian lives in a completely different world from an unbeliever. You see, Paul is not speaking here about different shades of grey, stretching from absolute light at one end to absolute darkness at the other end, with a whole lot of shades of grey in between. The world may look like shades of grey, and people look like shades of grey. But the spiritual truth and the spiritual reality is totally different. Walking in the spirit is a whole world of difference from walking in the flesh. Living in the spirit is a whole world of difference from living in the flesh. Setting your mind on the things of the Spirit is a whole world of difference from setting your mind on the things of the flesh. You see, the difference between the two worlds is not a quantitative one with different shades of grey. The difference between the two worlds is a qualitative one It's the difference between light and darkness, between spirit and flesh, between living a life that is right with God and living a life that is wrong with God. It's the difference between being a spiritual person or a carnal, worldly person. And I suppose that in the end of the day, it's the difference between heaven and hell. The break between the two lifestyles, the two options, is a radical break. It's not a continuous thing. There's a decisive break between the two worlds, as Jesus himself said. He that is not for me is against me. Now it seems to me that the fundamental teaching here on these two options can be seen in two realities that are highlighted by Paul. And these two realities are determined by a third reality. The first reality is the orientation of your life. Paul speaks about walking according to the Spirit. And that word walk in the New Testament has to do with the ordering of your life. It's a question of orientation and facing the right direction. I looked up the word orientation in the Chambers Dictionary. And it means this, the assumption of a definite direction in response to a stimulus. Something moves you. Something prods you. Something stimulates you. There's an inner reality in your life. And because of that stimulus, you assume a definite direction. You face a particular way. Uh, Cranfield, (coughs) in his very fine commentary on Romans, speaks of uh, the mind of the flesh, uh, quote, that is, its outlook, assumptions, values, desires, and purposes which those who take the side of the flesh share. And the mind of the spirit, 
the outlook, assumptions, values, desires and purposes which those who take the side of the spirit share. You see, it's a question of orientation. It's a question of um, facing in the right direction. And uh, Paul puts this uh, very strongly in uh, verse 12, where he uses the word debtor. (coughs) He says, um, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. And the word debtor means that you are under an obligation. This is something that you owe to God. If you profess to be a Christian, you are under an obligation to walk in the Spirit and to orientate your life like this. Let me illustrate this from the life of Jesus. You remember that at the start of his ministry, Jesus was a very successful and a popular preacher up in Galilee. And we read of the Galilean ministry that the crowds thronged to hear him and the common people heard him gladly. And there came a falling away. People grew tired of Christ's words because um, they felt the sting. They felt the challenge and Christ's call to come and die to self. That's the invitation of the gospel. And so the crowd thinned out a little bit. And then Jesus turned south and we read um, these pregnant words he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and the disciples saw the look on his face and they were disturbed because going to Jerusalem meant leaving Galilee facing trouble and the Pharisees and the spiritual Gestapo the sufferings and the cross but Jesus steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem it was a question of facing the right direction and of orientating his life are you facing the right direction this morning do you face the things of the spirit do you walk and order your life in the spirit Paul said to the Philippians This one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This one thing I do. It was the consuming passion of his life. He faced the right way. He walked in the Spirit. His life had the right orientation. And secondly, as well as the orientation of your life, there's another reality. There is the application of your mind and of your mental powers. In verse 5, Paul speaks about those who live according to the Spirit, set their mind on the things of the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh, set their mind on the things of the flesh. It is a matter of mental application. 
of um, studiously and incessantly focusing your thoughts on the things of the Spirit. And that's an exercise, you know, that is fervently commended to Christians in all the scriptures. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, says Isaiah, whose mind is stayed upon thee. We would tend to say nowadays, whose emotions are stayed on thee, or whose spiritual impressions are stayed on thee, or whose inner psychology is fixed on God. But Isaiah says that the perfect peace comes to those whose minds are stayed, fixed, and centered on God. It's a question of mental application. <clears throat> Consider these words from Paul's exhortation to the Philippian Christians. He says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is anything excellent or anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think. Apply your mind. Concentrate. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Let me give you two illustrations of this from um, my divinity student days. I found learning Hebrew very hard. Hebrew is an odd language. It's made up mostly of words that consist of three letters. Katal, Sefer, Chesed. And in the original Hebrew, there are no vowels. You just get three consonants. K-T-L. Now it could be Katal, or Kitel, or Kotel, or Kotil, because there are no vowels. And so, this makes Hebrew a hard language. How did we master it? Well, we bought blank postcards. And on one side of the card, we would write the Hebrew word. And on the other side, the Hebrew word with the vowels and the meaning. And as we traveled through Aberdeen by bus or train, we would flick through little packs of cards and uh, mutter the words. And so uh, the Aberdonians were treated to the spectacle of divinity students peering at cards with queer letters on them, muttering all the time. I wonder what they thought of us. I wonder if that's why the worst church attendance in Aberdeen, in Scotland, is found in Aberdeen. Did you know that the town church of Aberdeen is now a union of six churches? There are 1,500 members and they can scarcely get a hundred people on a Sunday morning. How did we master Hebrew? We applied our minds. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Or a second example, take the memorizing of Scripture. How do you memorize Scripture? Do you memorize Scripture? In my early Christian days, I bought Billy Graham's little book, a memory course. Little books, pocket size, divided into various sections on basic Christian teaching. The basic teaching on salvation, on service, on prayer, on witness, and sitting in buses and trains 
when I was not reading Hebrew cards. I was memorizing the Bible so that when any, anyone came with a question, I was able to answer him not with my own opinions, but with the opinions of God from the Bible. Those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. I think of how De Leach, the great German scholar of last century, used to rise early in the mornings and stand at his prayer desk. He had a chin-high prayer desk. And he would pray from five until eight in the morning. You see, if there is to be an orientation of your life, there must be the application of your mind to the things of the Spirit. What is the orientation of your life this morning? What direction are you facing this morning? Are you interested in the things of the Spirit or in the things of the flesh? What sort of programs do you watch on television? That propagator of Christless morality, that purveyor of godless values. Those who walk according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And lastly, underneath these two realities, the orientation of your life and the application of your mind, there is a final reality which in fact is the most important one because it determines the other two. It is the inner reality of your heart. Verse 9. You are in the Spirit if the Spirit of God dwells in you. And anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. And what Paul is speaking about here is the new birth, about the need to be born again of God. It's the teaching of the New Testament that the heart of man was meant to be a home for God. And that is the wonder of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that this almighty God, whom the heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot hold, such is the immensity of his being that this God chooses out for himself the hearts of sinners to be his dwelling place. And I suppose that's almost the definition of a Christian. Somebody who has been born again of God and who has God in his heart. See, a Christian is not simply someone who is kinder than other men, although it would be nice if all Christians were kinder than other people. It's not that a Christian is better or more charitable or more generous than other people. A Christian is someone who is the home of God by the Spirit. He has the indwelling Christ. He has the resident boss in his heart as a, a Chinaman once called the Holy Spirit when he couldn't find a Chinese word for the Holy Spirit. He translates, translated it the resident boss. And if you have the resident boss in your heart, you are a Christian. And that's something that doesn't happen automatically because Christ never comes in where he is not wanted. You'll never find Jesus barging his way into your little party if you want to keep him out. You must be born again. You must have the inner reality of the heart 
if you want the orientation of your life and the application of your mind. Jesus said, he must, he must, it's a question of necessity, he must be born again. And Paul says, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, we do confess that sometimes thy word solemnizes us. It can be sharp. It can be a challenge. And sometimes the light that comes from it exposes the dark places on the inside. But we bless thee that that light that exposes is also a light that heals and helps. So we pray thee to write thy word in all our hearts and may the blessing of it continue in days to come and all of that for our good and blessing and for the honor of Christ. Amen.